Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Sorry it's been quite a while since my last video. I've not actually been very well. I was ready for my voice to get better. And to make up for it, I've got a twofer for you today in our Napoleonic Figures series. It's a father and son duo that would lead some of the most magnificent charges in history, including one that Napoleon claimed won him his first major victory. This is the story of Francois and Etienne Kellerman. Francois Christophe de Kellerman was born on the 28th of May 1735 in Strasbourg into nobility. He was the only son of his father who was also called Francois because it seems that originality when naming boys of the Kellerman family were, uh, <laughs> was, was not very high. Uh, and his mother was the Saxon Baroness Marie von Dune. Kellerman was a born cavalryman and at 15 enrolled as a cadet volunteer in the Regiment de Lower Edath, which was a Hussar regiment. This was actually quite old to begin a military career, and I assume he completed his studies and waited for the right posting to come up, hence his later entry into the army than many of the other figures that will be on this list, particularly in France. Kellerman was in the French army during the conflict that tore the world apart, the Seven Years' War, and distinguished himself by leading a small cavalry detachment that captured some 300 Austrians. However, War makes men fit its needs, and he was commissioned as an ensign in the Royal Bavière Regiment of Infantry before being promoted to captain in 1758. He again would see action in Poland in 1771, becoming a Chevalier of the Order of St. Louis. In 1776, he was again promoted to captain commandant before he became a major in the Hussars of Conflans some three years later. Gellerman was climbing the ranks of the Royal Army with great speed, and continued to do so as the storm clouds of revolution gathered. He became Brigadier General in 1784, and in the following year, Marshal de Camp. While a number of Napoleon's marshals served in the Royal Army prior to the revolution, Kellerman was the only one to have reached such a senior rank under the Ancien Regime. Kellerman was an enthusiastic supporter of the French Revolution, and in 1791, he became General of the Army in Alsace. In April 1792, he was made a Lieutenant General, and it would be in September of that same year that Francois Kellerman Sr. would carve his name in stone. Literally, Kellerman is one of the names inscribed under the Arc de Triomphe on column 3. On one side was the French, high on revolutionary fervour, but they had been defeated in almost every major battle. At the core of that was the Royal Army, with about half the infantry, nearly all the cavalry, and most importantly of all in this case, most of the artillery being made up of long-service veterans. Military thinkers of the time considered the French artillery to their best in Europe, due in no small part to the reforms of Jean-Baptiste Vaquette de Guibreval. However, the two armies they were facing were the best in Europe, the Austrians and the infamous Prussians. These were the Prussians that Kellerman faced in the Seven Years' War. Known for their superb drill, they had been called Frederick's Volley Machine. Such was the accuracy, skill and speed of their firing. Even having combined his army with that of Dumouriez, his neighbour general, it would have been a battle any gambler would have betted heavily against the French in. There was a torrential rain before the battle, and taking up position on a rise, Kellerman ordered the nearby Moulin de Valmy be raised to prevent enemy artillery using it as a spotting location. Napoleon would write later, I think I'm the boldest general that ever lived, but I daren't take post on that ridge with the windmill of Valmy in 1793. As the Prussian volleying machine moved forward, they came under what would become known as the Cannonade of Valmy, a huge bombardment from the best artillery crews in the world. Even the stoic Prussians and their famed discipline couldn't stand that level of fire and fell back. The Prussians wavered, and Kellerman, sensing this was the turning point, perhaps of the very revolution itself, raised his hat and bellowed, Vive la nation! The cry was repeated again and again by the whole French army, and already under heavy fire, Prussian morale wavered. The French line surged forward, troops sang La Marseillaise and Sa Ira. To the surprise of nearly everyone, Brunswick broke off the action and retired from the field. The Prussians rounded the French positions at a great distance and commenced a rapid retreat eastwards. While casualties had been fairly light on both sides, Kellerman had shown that the newly born Republic could defeat the invincible Prussian war machine. Europe reeled in shock, and Kellerman pushed on into Germany, eventually taking the city of Metz. The German writer Goethe said that the victory of the French at Valmy opened a new era in the history of the world. 
The French army had clearly learned lessons from its previous defeats. After this incredible victory, the central front was left to Dumaret, who, to be fair, would make a complete pig's ear of it, and Kellerman was transferred to the army of the Moselle. He was later accused by General Adam Custine of neglecting to support his operations on the Rhine, but he was acquitted at the bar of the National Convention in Paris, and placed at the head of, an, and placed at the, head of the army of the Alps and of Italy, which, to be fair, if he'd been convicted, he probably would have been guillotined, so a promotion out of that's not terrible at all. And it was in this position as the general of the army of Italy that he showed himself to be a careful commander and an excellent administrator. Shortly afterwards, he received instructions to reduce Lyon, then in revolt against the convention. But shortly after the surrender, he was imprisoned in Paris for 13 months. Once more honourably acquitted, he was reinstated in his command and did good service in maintaining the southeastern border against the Austrians until his army was merged with that of a little-known figure, a General Napoleon Bonaparte in Italy. And so, with the merging of his army, the fighting career of Kellerman ended. While still a very competent general, at 62 years of age, and still physically equal to his work, the younger generals who had come to the front the previous two years represented the new spirit and the new art of war. The hero of Valmy was never forgotten, however. When Kellerman came to power, when Napoleon came to power, Kellerman was named successively senator in 1800, president of the Senate a year later, honorary marshal of France on 19th of May 1804, and given the title Duke of Valmy in 1808. In his service to the French Empire, Kellerman was frequently employed in the administration and training of the army. He also took control of the line of communications and command of reserve troops, and his long and wide experience would make him one of Napoleon's most valuable assistants. He was also a deeply political soldier, and in 1814 he voted for the deposition of the emperor, becoming a peer under the royal government of Louis XVIII. After the Hundred Days, he sat in the Chamber of Peers and voted with the Liberals before dying in Paris on the 23rd of September 1820, aged 85. His tomb is in Père Lachaise Cemetery, and as previously mentioned, his name is inscribed on the Arc de Triomphe. He's not the only Kellerman on there, though. His son, Francois Etienne de Kellerman, 2nd Duke of Valmy, also fought for Napoleon, and was another key figure in both the early days of the Directorate and the whole of the first French Empire. Due to the practice of male Due to the practice of pretty much every male Kellerman being called Francois, I'll be referring to the younger Kellerman by his middle name, Etienne. His son was also called Francois, and was a distinguished diplomat in the Second Empire. Born in Metz in 1770, you might remember that his father was later to capture that city from the Prussians. Etienne joined the army and the Hussars of Conflans under his father before leaving for the diplomatic corps in 1791. However, with his father being on campaign in 1793, the 23-year-old Etienne rejoined the military to serve with him, mostly serving in the Alps. By 1796, he was made chef de brigade and attracted the future emperor's notice by forcing the river Tagliamento that year and cutting off 3,000 Austrians who were to surrender with over 30 cannon. He was then made general of brigade immediately and continued in Italy after the peace of Campo Formio, being employed successfully in the armies of Rome and of Naples under respectively MacDonald and Champione. However, as good a diplomat as Etienne Kellerman may have been, it was on the field of Marengo in 1800 that he was to go down in history. There he commanded a heavy cavalry brigade under the first consul and he initiated and implemented one of the most famous cavalry charges in history. A general advance from the Austrians was forcing the tired French back, but leading the mass squadrons of Karazis and Dragoons, together with Dessay's infantry, they decided the issue of the battle. The French forces had fought all day and was under a general retreat. The Austrian troops had formed a large column to pursue the retreating French and destroy them utterly. In the evening, Kellerman's depleted cavalry brigade had to be occupied south of the field returned, joined by a few squadrons of dragoons and other elements. Etienne Kellerman's men perfectly timed their charge and rode down the pursuing three Austrian grenadier battalions. Then, rapidly reforming his troopers, charged and routed an Austrian dragoon regiment. The fleeing Austrian dragoons then stampeded through their own Austrian infantry columns, causing a general rout. This secured the French victory in a battle when only an hour earlier, all had seemed lost. He was promoted to general of division almost at once, but as early as the evening of the battle, 
He resented what he thought had been an attempt to belittle his exploits. A heated controversy followed as to the influence of Kellerman's charge on the course of the battle, and in this controversy he displayed neither tact nor forbearance. However, his merits were too great for his career to be ruined, either by his conduct in the dispute or by the frequent scandals and even the frauds of his private life. Kellerman's fame did not rest on one fortunate opportunity, however. Though perhaps not the most famous, he was probably the best of all Napoleon's heavy cavalry commanders. That said, just like La Salle, he could easily command outside of his class. Although associated with the heavy cavalry, he was to distinguish himself at the Battle of Austerlitz in command of a light cavalry division on the French left flank. Etienne Kellerman also commanded the cavalry division under Jean Andoche Junot in the 1807 invasion of Portugal and at the Battle of Vimerio. He led the Grenadier Reserve and, after the French defeat, used his considerable diplomatic skills in negotiating the Convention of Sintra. At the Battle of Alba de Tormes, on the 28th of November 1809, he led 3,000 troopers in a brilliant cavalry charge that routed Duke del Parc's Spanish army. He served with distinction on other occasions in the Peninsular War too. However, there was a darker side. Unlike his father Francois, who was brought up in the pre-Seven Years' War world of genteel warfare, of manoeuvre where armies marched five miles a day with huge trains of supplies, Etienne was living in the modern post-revolution world. Here, citizens were soldiers, and Spain was a ripe fruit to be plucked. His rapacity was notorious in Spain, perhaps even more so than La Salle or Mecenas. Yet Napoleon met accusations with unconvincing excuses and used the words, General, whenever your name is brought before me, I think of nothing but Marengo. In 1812, with the invasion of Russia, Kellerman was actually on sick leave, so avoided the worst of it. However, after the retreat, he joined the army in 1813, and in 1814, he led the 4th Cavalry Corps with consummate skill, in the battles for France. He retained his rank under the First Restoration, but joined Napoleon during the Hundred Days. There he commanded the Third Cavalry Corps in the Waterloo Campaign, which is where he was to get a second moment of glory. He led his squadrons in a famous cavalry charge at the Battle of Quatre Bras on the 16th of June 1815. In this action, Kellerman was preemptorily ordered by Marshal Ney to make a frontal charge on the Anglo-Allied line with 770 troopers of Guiton's Carazia Brigade. Against cavalry doctrine, Kellerman called for an immediate gallop so that his men would not see how badly they were outnumbered. In four separate charges, the 8th and 11th Carraziers broke the 69th foot and captured the colour, scattering a Hanoverian battalion and sent the 33rd and 73rd foot fleeing for the safety of a nearby wood. It was due to this battle that until their falling into the Yorkshire Regiment, 33rd wore a red triangle as the backing of their cap badge. This was to commemorate the triangle they formed to see off Kellerman's cavalry, being so badly cut up that the regiment wasn't able to form a traditional square due to the number of casualties they'd taken. The horsemen briefly seized the crucial crossroads, but the odds were too great. Unhorsed, Kellerman narrowly escaped capture by holding on to the stirrups of one of his retreating cavalrymen. Two days later at Waterloo, he was wounded. Initially, Kellerman's two divisions were deployed in support of the infantry in the left centre of the line. Early on, Carazias, either Kellerman's or Meode's, destroyed a carelessly deployed Hanoverian infantry battalion. But it was to be on the afternoon of that day that one of the greatest sights of the Napoleonic Wars was to be seen. Ney sent the 3rd Cavalry Corps into a mass attack against the British infantry squares between Hougoumont and La Haye-Sainte. So close did the horses have to press to carry out the charge, the dead horses were often carried along, squeezed between the flanks of their neighbours. That moving wall of horse flesh and of glittering steel, the May sunshine gleaming off the brass helmets and breastplates of the carabineers, must have been something to behold. But, as impressive as it was, and despite two battalions of KGL, the 5th and the 8th being run down by Carazias, possibly Kellermans, Ney's charge was a complete disaster. The futile and repeated charges against the main Allied line, failing to break a single square, and using up the magnificent French cavalry. Kellerman was disgraced at the Second Restoration, and on succeeding to his father's title and seat, in the Chamber of Peers in 1820, upon the, the former's death, Etienne took up and maintained it till the fall of Charles X in 1830, an attitude of determined opposition to the Bourbons. He died on the 2nd of June, 1835. So that's the story of the two Kellermans, both called Francois, Francois the Elder and Francois Etienne the Younger. And as is always the case on this channel, I say, look, it's... Not a history channel, it's a wargaming channel. So how can we 
how can we adapt them to the tabletop? Well, I think the two of them both have one thing in common, and that's, I think, probably the most important thing a Napoleonic general could have had, and that was the ability to see the critical moment of a battle. I think they're both excellent commanders. I'd give them both a strategy rating of 8, as they both had their best successes. Francois at Valmy, Etienne at Marengo. By seeing, and I think you could almost sort of feeling the correct time to launch their charges. For this reason, whatever rule is given to them, I'd make it probably a once per game rule. I'd make it quite strong, but it's only a once per game thing. And it's really on the commander of the army, the general, the player of the game, for them to recognise that crucial moment. So I think I'd almost certainly make it a once per game thing and to do with having a charge as well. So my suggestion would be that once per game, either Kellerman could order a brigade charge order, which counted as strategy rating 10. This means that they are very unlikely to fail at all. They're incredibly likely to get a long charge off. So it's that thing if you can hold them back in reserve until that crucial moment. They're probably going to get at least two moves, probably three moves off. But that's balanced out by the fact that the defending infantry, if it's against infantry, will have the ability and the bonuses to form square for finding that way away. So miniature-wise, I've there's a few out there of Etienne, because he was at War 2, the Perrys do one. Um, I think if you're going to do either Kellerman, really, there's nothing particularly individualistic about them. They're not like LaSalle or uh, General Hill or someone like that. Uh, sorry, not Hill, uh, General Picton. There, there's nothing sort of unique about them like that. So you could just use a General de Brigade or a, a General de Division figure, a General one. Um, I think... If it's after 1809, there's an argument to say they should be wearing a cuirass, or, well, Etienne should be wearing a cuirass. But I think overall, you could use pretty much any heavy cavalry commander for the French, I think. So, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Once again, sorry for the delay on getting this episode out. We've covered a number of figures in our Napoleonic Figures series. I've got a couple lined up already. I've got a, quite an interesting uh, guerrilla leader. And then another interesting one from the Tyrol region as well. So I hope looking forward to those. Thank you very much for listening. See you next time. Goodbye.